In this video, I'm going to go over some formulas you need to know if you're studying the application of derivatives. So the first thing you need to be able to do is calculate the average rate of change. The average rate of change is basically the slope of the secant line. A secant line is a line that touches the curve at two points. So this is the average rate of change formula. It's f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So let's say if you have a curve that looks like this, this line will be a secant line because it touches the curve at two points. The first point at which it touches the curve that is point A. The second point is point B. So this is the average rate of change formula. Now sometimes you need to calculate the instantaneous rate of change. The instantaneous rate of change is basically evaluating the derivative at some point. This could be point C. The instantaneous rate of change is equal to the slope of the tangent line. So at this point, at some point C, the slope of the tangent line will equal the slope of the secant line. And that's the basic idea behind the mean value theorem. So here's the basic definition for the mean value theorem. If f of x is continuous on the closed interval AB, and if it's differentiable on the open interval AB, then there is some number C in the interval AB or between AB, which we could see C is between AB, such that F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So that's the basic idea behind the mean value theorem which I'm going to abbreviate MVT. So for the mean value theorem, as you can see, the slope of the secant line and the slope of the tangent line, they're the same at this point. The average rate of change formula gives you the slope of the secant line, and the instantaneous rate of change will give you the slope of the tangent line. But when dealing with the mean value theorem, those two will equal each other. Now, the next theorem you need to be familiar with is Rolle's theorem. If f of x is continuous on the closed interval AB and differentiable on the open interval AB, and if f of A is equal to f of B, if these three conditions are met, then there's going to be some number C in the open interval AB where f prime of c is equal to zero. So here's a good example of this. Let's say we have a graph that looks like this. And let's say here this is a and this is b. Notice that these a and b have the same y value. So this is f of b and this is f of a. Because they have the same y value, they are equal to each other. So if the endpoints of an interval are equal at some point between a and b, there's going to be a horizontal tangent. And at that horizontal tangent, f prime of c will be 0. So c is basically the intersection of the curve and the horizontal tangent. And the derivative at that point will be zero. So that's the basic idea behind Rolle's theorem. By the way, for those of you who want all of these formulas, uh, you could find it in the formula sheet in the description section below. Now, if you need to calculate average velocity, you can use the average rate of change formula. So it's S of B minus S of A 
over B minus A. So if you want to find the average velocity for the closed interval AB, you can use that formula. So S represents position. A and B will be specific time values on a position time graph. Because velocity is average velocity. Well, velocity is displacement over time. And displacement is the change in position. So SB minus SA, that's the displacement. Now, the average acceleration is going to be the change in velocity divided by the change in time. So you can also use the average rate of change formula, but instead of having the position function on the top, you're going to have the velocity function on the top. So that's how you can calculate average velocity and average acceleration on the closed interval AB. Now, if you wish to calculate the instantaneous velocity, it's the derivative of the position function. And if you wish to calculate instantaneous acceleration, it's the derivative of the velocity function. So those are some additional formulas that you need to know. If you ever need to find critical points, you need to find the first derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve for x. x is going to be your c value if you need to find critical points. A critical point can also occur if f prime of c doesn't exist. That's also, that can also be a critical point. So in that case, you would look for a vertical tangent. Now here's some other things you want to know. f of x is increasing whenever the first derivative is greater than zero or basically when it's positive. f of x is decreasing whenever the first derivative is less than zero or when it's negative. And f of x, the function, is going to be constant if the first derivative is equal to zero, which is basically where you'll have a horizontal tangent. Now, the function is concave up. That is, f is concave up when the second derivative is greater than zero or positive. f is concave down when the second derivative is less than zero or negative. So anytime the second derivative is positive, f is concave up. If the second derivative is negative or less than zero, f is concave down. So if we had a shape that looks like this, we could see this one has the up, upward U shape. This part is concave up. This one has the downward U shape. So uh, that is concave down. At some point, the concavity changes from up to down. And that's going to be the midpoint between uh, the local minimum and the local maximum. So at this point, when the concavity changes, that is the inflection point. So notice that the second derivative changes at that point. So here, the second derivative is positive because it's concave up. So I'm just going to highlight that part in red where it's concave up. And then here, it's concave down. So that's when the second derivative is negative. So when the second derivative changes from positive to negative, it has to cross 0. So at the inflection point, the second derivative is equal to 0. 
So that's how you could find the inflection point. If you, if you want to find a critical point, you would set the first derivative equal to zero and solve for x. And your x value will be your c value. If you want to find the inflection point, you would find a second derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for x. However, you just need to make sure the concavity changes. So you may need to use a number line to check if it changes sign. So let me give you an example of that. So let's say the second derivative is 0 when x is 2 and 5. And let's say this is positive, this is negative, this is negative. So since we're dealing with the second derivative, here it's concave up, concave down, concave down. This would be an inflection point because the concavity changes, even though the second derivative is 0 here. Now the second derivative is 0 at 5 as well. However, the concavity does not change. So this is not an inflection point. So you got to check the signs to make sure that it changes when f double prime is zero. If it doesn't change, then you're not dealing with a, an inflection point. So to give you an example of that, here it's, so here it's concave up, then it's concave down. Let's see. And then it could be like this. So I'm going to highlight this part in red. It's concave up. And then concave down. But notice this part is also concave down. So here where it's green, the second derivative can be 0. But here it's concave down. Second derivative is 0. And then it's concave down again. So this would typically be considered a saddle point as opposed to an inflection point. Now, there are some other formulas associated with the application of derivatives. I'm going to post those other formulas in the formula sheet. So if you want the rest of the notes that's associated with this video, feel free to check out that formula sheet down in the links below. So that's going to be the end of this video. Thanks again for watching and Feel free to check out my other videos and my playlist at video-tutor.net.